Welcome back. Well, today we are going to be talking about three very important uh, factors when it comes to uh, our sense of satisfaction and fulfilment uh, when it comes to the work we do, uh, you know, the jobs that we get. And then once we are in a job, actually our experience of really not only doing a great job, whether you're somebody who's in the job itself, but also as a leader, uh, your experience of feeling like you've done a really great job uh, with the people that you've brought into the business. Um, but where we're going to start on that conversation is uh, three things in particular. The first one is going to be about trust. So I think trust is a very, very big conversation uh, when it comes to many things actually in an organisation around team performance, how we relate to each other, uh, how we feel whether we belong uh, in an organisation or how we feel like we can communicate confidently, feel connected with the people we work with, which as you know, inevitably gives us a sense of satisfaction in the jobs that we do. Um, the second factor we're going to talk about is this area of capability. But what I'm specifically interested in, in unpacking today is the part about alignment. See, there is an expectation in a company the way, where you're employing people that, you know, and as a business owner or whether you're in HR or, you know, you're uh, an executive and you've got accountability on bringing capability into the business, you know, you've got to, you've got to deal with what am I actually looking for and what is the capability I need in a business? So there's one side. Then on the other side, we we have from an employee's perspective, well, what are my capabilities? What are my talents? What are my skills? And where do I thrive? And, you know, in one environment, I might have a certain experience in one capability, but then I might heighten my capability in another area, depending on the culture. And as you can already see, just in saying that, there are a number of dynamics at play. Now, when you get those dynamics kind of all working in sync, in harmony, however you want to call it, uh, we have what's called alignment. So the thing that I want to talk about and unpack today is alignment capability, uh, which is getting everything to sing in harmony. And oh, what the perfect uh, final part we're going to talk about when we're talking about actually singing, uh, not that I'm much of one myself, uh, but is the X factor, uh, which, you know, you may, if you think about the X factor in itself, we're really talking about being the best that we can possibly be. And there's a whole world about that when it comes to capability, uh, our performance in the workplace, how much we can get the X factor out of uh, the people in the business and what does that even look like. So to talk about these three things, we have the, in my humble opinion, the guru uh, it, when it comes to this space. And today uh, we're going to be speaking with um, Mike Erlen. And firstly, I need to make sure I even have the pronunciation of his surname correct. Have I got it right, Mike? That's it, like Berlin without the B. Berlin without the B. I like that. Um, so, Mike, firstly, I just want to say thank you for coming in and, and joining me to talk about this today. Thank you for the opportunity. So, um, so I'm just going to give you a bit of, let's just give you a bit of background and context to Mike's experience and why we're talking to Mike. Um, you know, Mike is a co-founder of an organisation called Ability Map. Uh, he's been in the tech HR space for, let's just say, many, many years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, but back in, uh, what, since the 90s, 1995, 1999, you've been combining uh, tech enablement and human performance with some of the world's uh, biggest experts in the area. Yep. I mean, not only that, you've you've partnered up with, and this is something that I don't know a lot about, so I'm actually also ask, want to talk to you about this, is your relationship with your co-founder, because you've gone into business with Kevin Chandler, who was the original founder of Chandler McLeod, right? That's so, correct. Which is an extraordinary organisation. So there's, a, there's so many things that I want to talk about, um, but I've kind of put you on a bit of a spot as well, because we are going to talk about your story in particular. And we're going to get into these things, but I'm really fascinated for us to hear about, you know, why you're here and how you got to where you got to, which is inevitably based on your own personal experiences. And of course, starting with the area of trust, um, you know, we can talk about trust and theoretical talk about trust, but, you know, unfortunately, when you talk with me, we have to get into the, let, let's just put the spot a lot on ourselves, shall we? Sure. Um, but to, before we get started, I do want us to start with your vision or purpose for why you started Ability Map? Okay. All right. Well, um, I'll keep it somewhat brief, but 
coming from San Francisco, I grew up with a kid whose dad was a guy who started a company, and his name was Bill Fair. And Bill Fair created a company called the Fair Isaac Company. And in the United States, it was responsible, still is, for the FICO score. <clears throat> and the FICO score being? The FICO score is a measure of credit worthiness of an individual. And it is absolutely critical. If you have a good FICO score, you get a good loan. If you have a bad FICO score, you get a bad loan or may not even get a loan. And over the course of my career, what I got frustrated with was as much as I care about people interviewing well, developing people well, when I looked out across, really I started this in 2005 after working for a few years, I looked back and I said, how come I get it wrong so often? And I wanted the equivalent of a FICO score to tell me if a person had the capabilities to do the job that I needed well. I wanted it simple. Right, right. That was my motivation. <laughs> so I am interested in one thing you just said there, though, about um, – and, you know, it often takes courage to in, – in the, in the journey of change, right, you know, it's just it's a very funny parallel where I was having this conversation with my son <laughs> about if you keep doing what you're already doing, honey, you're not actually going to get any change. So sometimes you've actually got to be willing to take a look at what you're not doing that's not working. And, and honestly, you know, whether it's him or anyone, it, it, it takes a, cur a courageous person to take a look at going what's not working – to stop and look at the external factors and say, oh, God, my goodness, what am I not doing here that's having this result show up? So you you just made a comment saying you we, what, what were you doing wrong or what you didn't – I don't know if you used the word wrong, but what when you say that, what was going on? Were you employing people that just working out or – No, I mean it was, it was a situation where uh, I think everyone experiences it. You – you, uh, you know, you post a job or you're hiring a, a number of people to expand your team. Um, you meet these folks, your, your HR recruitment team gives you CVs. You know, you have a great interview. You look at their, you look at their, their background. They've done what it is. Um, you got a little bit of rapport going on. And it's all good. And they get in the job and it's like, oh, my gosh, they, they, they don't get that. Right. Right? Yeah, right. And so immediately you go, okay, let's, let's go help them get that. Right. You support your team. You want them to be successful. You bring in whatever it is. Mm. And six months later, you realize you've got somebody in the bottom third of your team, and there's probably two or three others more like that. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. You've got the other ones up there that are, you know, the, you know, the 20%, 30% that are in the top, and you've got the people in the middle that are consistent. But where we spend our time, and quite frankly, where the, the employees in that bottom third are, they're the ones that are having anxiety about the role they picked in because they're not doing well, yeah, right? Yeah, and, and that's just a drain on the system. So how do we solve it? Well, uh, you know, most companies, particularly, you know, high-performance companies will say, okay, we're going to, you know, drop the bottom 20%, mm -hmm. bottom 30% this year. Then you go through it again. Mm -hmm. Then you got to onboard them. So we've got this inbuilt error factor that's been, it's been a persistent problem, one-third problem for decades. And even as the technology's gotten better, all the stuff that I've been doing for the last 20 years, and we've been using psych assessment for how many decades, mm. yet we still got this, <laughs> we still got this. That's, that's a massive number, one third. That's what the research says. That's what we found. That's what I saw. I mean, think about it. If you got a team of 30 people, what percentage, you know, great. Maybe there's some people out there that have 10% consistently. Good mm, on you. I want to mm. check your business <laughs> out, right? Yes. But being honest about it, and yes. a third's probably a bit more, uh, can be a bit much. I would say that I probably didn't have a third because I'm pretty good at what I do and this is right. my space. Right. But 20%. Was, right. was pretty reasonable. So uh, if I, I kind of putting it in the frame myself, you know, I mean, because uh, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of my own experiences having been in a, you know, a role where I had to recruit staff as well. But even from my own perspective in going for jobs, you know, if I look on both sides of, the, of, of that, I, what we're saying is one in every three people that I would employ uh, were, were not really a, a, an ultimate fit. Best fit, best fit, so, so to speak. And not only from my own perspective about their performance in the job, but for themselves, that they Absolutely. were in, an, in, a, in, a, in a job for themselves, whether I thought it or not, that they were having the experience of suffering or being out of their depth or not being able to deliver because it just wasn't the right job for them. Well, let's go back to your son, the, the comment you made about your son, okay? Yeah. One of the biggest issues that we have all done in helping our children is what do we say to them? We go, hey, Connor. What do you want to be when you grow up? No wonder they stress out. <laughs> 
really great point. Right? I mean, seriously, my kids. I mean, I had no clue at fourteen. What? Do, what do you mean, Mum? And I and that's you know what that that's actually what he says to me. Yeah. What okay. do you mean? What do you mean? I go. Oh. You wonder why we get counselling bills as they get older, right? <laughs> but yes. seriously, think about that. If I, instead I said to Connor, "Hey, Connor, here's what you're inherently capable and suited, and you enjoy doing." Here, and here are the jobs that require that to be successful. Mm. Which of these jobs do you like? Mm. That's a whole different conversation. Oh, God, yeah. God, yeah. I mean, okay. I, yeah, I'm all, already thinking about... Uh, I had a conversation about 12 months ago with uh, a lady at the University of New South Wales. Mm -hmm. You know, they reached out to me. I had been speaking in an event and, you know, they were fascinated by kind of some of the work that I was doing. And so we had a, a coffee with her. And it was surprised me because we're... I, 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 you know, first I thought, oh, we're, we're coming in and we're going to talk to the leaders about stuff, right? But she said, listen, I really want to talk to you about the open days we have for our students. And I said, oh, yes, tell me more about that. And she says, oh, the biggest problem we've got, you know, of course their biggest market was the corporates, right, who mm -hmm. come in and they pay them to go in and promote their businesses to those, you know, to the, to the you know, the, the graduates, yeah. right? It's a graduate yeah, program. Absolutely. We're going to promote these companies and we're going to develop and we'll put you in front of them. Now, of course, the problem was that you got all these organisations coming in there shouting their, 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 their wares about how great they are and what they can offer. And, and I, as I was listening to her, I was fascinated because all I could hear was how everything was about the organisation talking about how fabulous they are, which was all about their brand, their money that they could offer, the prospects of their development in their career. Now, now they're all valuable things to talk about, of right? Course, yeah. But the thing that was missing for me was, okay, so what we're saying to a graduate is your decision about what comes next in your pathway is all based on the brand, the money and the development path. We're not even looking at... What are actually, let's first start with what are your capabilities? What are you actually really great at? Where do you thrive? No, 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 we're not even looking at that. Nor are we looking at, well, what are the actual match then of the capability in the organisation th that that company is? I mean, who's to say that you might want to go, oh, we're going to go work at AMP because it's a beautiful brand and, the, you know, blah, blah, blah. But who's to say it's the right culture fit for that particular individual? Now, I say this, right, because when you just said what you did, well, I was immediately present to the whole world of graduates yeah. and, and, and the missing missing piece of the puzzle. We're setting up people at that age for having anxiety, <laughs> uh, dissatisfaction, a lack of engagement in their jobs, feeling like they're out of depth. I mean, imposter syndrome. Where the hell should we start? Well, actually, if you take that... that example you're using right there, just consider what the, one of the biggest issues facing the universities are right now is retention of people completing their degrees, but then also getting placement. Mm. So wouldn't it be nice if instead of the, you know, the, uh, the young lady who's grown up in a family of lawyers who's going to UNSW or U, U Sydney to get a law degree, if we actually helped her identify that she has a high degree of uh, understanding others' needs, um, is very good at identifying and managing risk and probably would be really good in the aged care area. Yeah, yeah. Right? And yeah. start that out. And yes. then let's see what happens to the completion of the course rate and her ability to get a job in which she's fulfilled. Yes. So, again, those are areas that, that we have um, explored. We've got some early conversations. We're, um, we have chosen to apply that, uh, that logic, that concept to... Um, I'm, I'm starting to laugh because of what my partner did over COVID, I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> but um, we're applying that to, to companies and um, uh, businesses that are trying to either figure out how we have to make these very important decisions, we're not getting it right enough, how do we improve the predictability of that? Mm -hmm. How can we look at across our existing workforce, understand what is our, we call it a capability balance sheet against the requirements of the job. And maybe we'll talk about what is good mm. in, a mi in a moment. Mm. And then that allows you to identify in a very targeted, high impact way at a team level or at an individual level, where should you be helping, developing, providing support interventions to help individuals be more successful in their role. When you're making a new decision, <laughs> do a better job. Yeah. But when we've got these great people that we brought in because we liked them, mm. I mean, half the time that's why you bring somebody in, right? Yes. You had a good interview. Oh, you yeah. liked them. You'd have a beer with them. Yes. Well, let's help them be more successful. But anytime we got a new new opportunity, 
do a better job. Yeah. So that's where we're, we focus. Okay, well, let, let's talk about that in a bit more detail yeah. then. So I think the great thing that uh, we, we, we ought to look at here is, well, what does good really look like? Like, really, actually, what does it really look like? Do we even know? Um, and I want uh, I, I want us to talk about this conversation in two different dimensions. Okay. Um, I want to look at the dimension from if you're a business owner or an executive accountable for making a decision about bringing in people, what does good look like? But then on the on the other end, we're then dealing with as an individual looking for uh, their own their own capability, and so kind of the all aspects. You know, if I took a lens from all different perspectives, what does good look like? Right. Okay. So um, I I like sailing. Do you have a sport that you like to do? Me. Yeah. I love triathlons. Okay, triathlons. Fantastic. All right. So you do all this training. You do all that stuff, and you show up on Saturday or Sunday morning to run your triathlon. Mm -hmm. What if you didn't know where the finish line was? <laughs> I'd be in trouble. <laughs> right. Would you still go out there and run? Well, I guess I would, I'd, but I'd spend the entire run in anxiety, I think. Yeah, I mean, you actually would never finish, right? No. So the point is, if you don't know where the finish line is, why mm. would you start running? Mm. Okay? Mm. That's the issue with what does good look like. What's happened is subjectivity in particular and bias affect what we all think. Not, it's unconscious, we're not bad people, but it, it's, it's, we're doing our best, but we're wrong in what we think drives performance, and we prove that every day. So I'll give you an example. We worked with two very large tech companies, global tech companies, their Australian divisions, um, with their sales teams. Um, just for the sake, they, we did about... Uh, probably in each one, 400 of their sales people as well as all of their sales managers. And we went across and we asked all their sales managers, hey, what do each of you, call it 40, um, what do each of you believe drives high performance in your salesperson's role? Okay, and they, we have a platform. They use the platform. It takes about 10 minutes. Out of 40 different sales managers, how many different views do you think we got as to what the capabilities are that make for a rock star salesperson? I'm going to go with 40. Bingo. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that happens every day. Now, yes. if you think about that, what's the knock-on effect to that if you're hiring, I don't know, 50 salespeople and all these sales managers are interview interviewing them trying to find out? How do you think that's going from a consistency standpoint? Oh, my God, it's a disaster. Right. So do you think that has any effect on that one-third I talked about at the start? Oh, my goodness. I think it would actually have a bigger impact. I'm just thinking about what happens when they're actually then in the business, right? I'm trying to imagine, you know, 40 people around a table. And I've had this conversation in a different area around strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> you know how many people as executives you sit – so I was a strategy director at one point and, uh, you know, so I was accountable for – I was accountable for strategy. But then you would sit around an executive meeting and you'd have – I can't tell you the conversations that felt like they would go around in circles because clearly people thought they knew what strategy was. Well, they had their, let's say, they had their interpretation or their perspective about what strategy was. And so none, there, it was just really, really, like just at the end of the day, a disaster. You couldn't really get the best out of the team because people were not really communicating from the same perspective or get, or nor, let's just say, aligned. They didn't get to a point of being aligned on the perspective. So you just keep running around in circles. So that's kind of what I'm reminded by when you say that because if you've got 40 people in the sales teams and they're all operating off a completely different perspective about what makes them great, that is a recipe for disaster in teamwork. That's right. Total, actually, totally. I agree. So then extend that a second. So um, if you go back to sort of what we've all done in the people space for decades, if you can get the v head of sales to line up and say, yes, I'm going to bring my sales managers together – put it as a global business where it's even harder. You go around and you fly to all these places or you have a Zoom nowadays. You show them these cards. You have to explain to them what capabilities are. What are the ones you think that are important? And you debate it. You spend a day doing this and the line managers are ready to neck themselves because they hate that stuff. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Yes. Right, okay. So what, our, what we do is because it's on a platform, we then show these 40 sales managers, hey, here's what you think strongest and in common as a group. 
And they look at it because it bubbles up everything that they all think the top priorities. They go, that's exactly what we want. We go, cool. That's what you want, right? Yep, that's exactly what we want. That's what drives high performance. I'll go, yes, that's what drives high performance. <laughs> then what we do is we go out and we evaluate using another part of our platform. There are 400 salespeople. Okay? And we do it without subjectivity and bias because we're doing it reliably with valid tools and mm. all that sort of stuff. And then we come back and we say, hey, guess what? Here are the top capabilities that actually exist in your workforce today. And we have not seen an instance where there were more than three that were what the sales managers wanted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they weren't the top three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that what good looks like is, mm -hmm. is, is influenced by each of our own personal experiences. It can't be anything but that. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we all think different things. And even if HR is doing a heck of a good job in listening to 40 different views and synthesizing it down to what they're telling them in general, it ain't what they have. Yes. Okay? Yes. Now, what you need is actually the people out of those 400 who are consistently behaving and delivering the way you want today, or you start talking about the future of work, the way you think it's going to be tomorrow because we can't step into the future mm. yet as far as I know. Yes. So you got to go, yeah, Kylie's kind of got that thing that I think is going to be there. But anyway, we can then take that group of people. Right. And we can go, hey, you know, out of those 400, there's about 30. That right. Are rock star good year over year over year. And we're, we then show what makes them tick. Yeah, right. And we compare that to what they have in the business. Mm. It ain't the same. Right. We compare that to what the leaders want, not the same, mm. but that's the X factor that you're looking for. Mm. Sorry, I kind of got to the X factor. First. No, that's great. I mean, you know, it's all going to show up at the right time, right? <laughs> that's really, that's fantastic. Thank you. And what about the, uh, on the other side of the equation called, uh, so from an organiser, I get that from within the organisation, how that works. As somebody who's in the market, say, well, let's just say you've got a stack of those. Let's talk about those, th the 30%, well, the, the third. Mm -hmm. The bottom third who are in a job that really d is not a match for their base capability, right? Totally. Let, let's just say, okay, we've dealt with the equation called there's the accountability of the organisation in the setup and they're all that, that side of things. But what is an individual, you know, when it comes to what they do and how they can be more accountable for looking for the kind, like, I, I mean, I've spoken to a lot of people who are really, you know, when they're looking for their their next job it's just again it's just an autopilot way of looking for well what are the positions and job descriptions that are a match for my current job description they're not actually fundamentally clear about with the, the this the capabilities or how those particular like, which ones do i want to go for i mean how do how do we solve that problem well we haven't gotten there yet right okay but um fortunately or tragically we we think we have a pretty good answer. And, and here's why I'll say that, is because as soon as COVID started hitting, particularly in the States, I started getting calls from people who'd been, either their kids had been knocked out of jobs they were in, mm. um, or they got knocked out of jobs, and mm. they said, Mike, I kind of know what you do, can you help us? Mm. And of course, yeah, they're my mates. So I said, do this imprint, do this evaluation. And what we basically did was, it would identify their strongest inherent preference capabilities, also their cognitive attributes. Mm. And because we've been doing this for so many businesses, we got a boatload of what we call profiles of all these different things that relate to business analysts, salesperson, CEO, HRD, um, you know, HR business partner, I mean, um, executive assistant, office man. I mean, I can go on and on mm -hmm. and on, right? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of recruiters that use our system, mm -hmm. so you can imagine how many profiles that we have. Yes. And, um, and basically, uh, I had actually um, my daughter, she probably won't listen to this podcast, so it's okay. Her, her boyfriend um, had his own electrical business, and, um, you know, it's hard. He runs a business. I'm impressed with him. He also has a full-time job with a bigger firm, and he was burning out. Mm. And he goes, Mike, can you help me? And I go, absolutely. Mm. I won't tell you his name because then I get in trouble. Mm. But um, he did our imprint, and what I saw is that he had high degree of understanding needs. He was very good at personal selling. Mm. Um, he was pretty good at achieving plans. And when I matched him up against our, all the profiles in our system, he kept hitting sales. Wow. And I go, Hamish, well, there you go, Hamish. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so, sorry. So I, I'm Can not you laughing edit that? at that. I'm not. I'm laughing at that because I'm pretty sure before we started, it was more my concern that I might drop names, <laughs> and I didn't do it. You did it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, actually, we probably need to edit that. So yeah, yeah. Uh, somehow, but um, anyway, my my point was. Uh, we probably do need to edit that. So, so yeah. let me let me pause, uh, and so uh, I want to talk with you about um, the other side of the equation. Yeah. So you know we've had a really great look at from an organisation when it comes to capability and getting capability into the yep. business. Right. There's there's stuff that we can do as executives to now identify what is it that we're looking for. What does really good look like? Um, but what, let's talk about the bottom third of the equation. You know, the people who are stuck in a job where um, they, they, if they feel frustrated, they're not really happy, they, they're stuck with a world of anxiety or imposter syndrome or whatever it is, or maybe they just don't feel like they, they've got it. You know, there's just something. They're, they're not experiencing, let's call it, the X factor. They're not winning. They're not winning, right? They're not winning. They're not winning. So let's. So we've talked about there's definitely the responsibility or uh, of the organisation now what they can do and how you help them doing that, okay? Mm -hmm. I now I just want to go on to the other side of the equation called for those individuals who are... You know, and, and in the current climate, we're talking about a lot of people who Tons. are now gone out of jobs. So I just want to now flip the conversation into that domain mm -hmm. so that you can share with me some insights around how does how does what you do help so the kind of people take a look at how can I take more accountability for my side of things? Okay. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And actually, we're seeing increased demand, um, interestingly, in our customers as well because we started out with a focus on talent acquisition because of Kev's background, right? I mean, he built a billion and a half dollar staffing and recruitment company. That's mm. where he comes from. I come more from the L&D talent management space. But whether it's individuals or, or um, companies, what we're seeing is people, when they have a growth mindset, open mindset, and they want to get better, they're open to doing an imprint so that it can Id catalog their inherent level of capability across all the human skills, the transferable skills that people apply and work. Mm. Okay, that's, that's what one side of our platform does. From there, they're then able to compare themselves to um, uh, different levels of profile. So I'll give you an example. Um, we have a, a, a partner, a gentleman that, I, that we work with um, named Dr. Marcus Bowles. He did five years worth of research into leadership in the digital economy. What are the capabilities? He's rock star good. I love the guy, okay? He asked me to put him under NDA because he goes, I see what you're doing, but I want to know how you're doing it. And <laughs> I put him under NDA. I lifted up the hood. I showed him under the hood, and he goes, give me that tool, the profile tool. He did, 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 and then all of a sudden he goes, all right, you can put my name on that. That enables my five years of research across any business. So mm -hmm. the reason I'm telling you that is that once you have an imprint, you can compare to something like that. Mm -hmm. You can then look at yourself compared to different profiles for Carol Dweck's growth mindset. Mm -hmm. You can look at what it takes to be a business partner in, HR, in SAP. Mm. You can look at what it takes to be a, a sales representative in Salesforce, mm. okay? And when you see that, it goes back to what we were talking about for your son, right? Mm. Hey, here's your inherent strengths. Here's where you've got strong fit to those roles. Now, identify at the next level down, where are you strong and where's your opportunity? Right. Because your opportunity is where you want to develop your capability Yes. in those areas. Yes. Now, the hard part <laughs> is if you have your imprint, it says here's your catalog and here's your level, and you go out and you're trying to say, oh, I want to be a doctor. Yes. Okay. But you have no right being a doctor because you hate all the stuff that a doctor needs to do. You do not have an inherent preference capability mm. to do it. Mm. You go down that path, you take schooling, you do all that stuff, you go there, you are going to neck yourself mm. in 10 years, mm. right? So it's about identifying your capabilities finding the roles that need that. You're not going to be perfect across everything. Building in the, rounding out the areas where you need to pull up, now you're playing to your strengths and you're happier. Right. So do, do you deal with, um, once you've got your imprint and you've got clarity for yourself over your capabilities, 
the, the next question for me becomes, and this is something that I've dealt with a lot with clients, and, and, I, and I get them to look individually at their side of things first, and then I say, okay, now let's take a look at what are the kinds of organisations or companies that would be a good place for you to thrive in. Now, I, I don't have visibility on data, right? I just have them do the thinking based on that, but I... Based on the fact that you're doing the imprint or the profiling, whatever, with organisations, do you have the capability where you can almost match them or show them which sectors, which companies, which type of we, areas? We absolutely have the capability. But I'll give you I'll give you a project we did. It was actually one of our largest projects to date. We worked with one of the big four consulting firms, and they had um, established a contract with one of the state governments to try to break the code of the long-term unemployed mature age worker situation, okay? So we went out to a place in one of the states um, whereby there's a lot of long-term unemployed mature age workers. In this particular area, their manufacturing was the big driver out there. There were 300 people. These 300 people broadly had been unemployed for six months. Now, you know what that means. Mm. That means they're going on 20 job interviews a month, mm. at least. That meant they've been rejected 20 times a month, times six. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. These poor people mm. are in a world of hurt. Mm. What, what this firm saw that we could do was to possibly redirect this talent in areas where they would not have the issue of getting knocked out of manufacturing every time. And mm. I'll give you one example. There was a old gen an older gentleman who had been in manufacturing, working on the line, and he just kept getting turfed, okay? Mm. He completed his imprint. We did exactly what you're saying. We had 15 job categories that were available out in the area, okay? Um, the gentleman had um, a high degree of understanding others' needs, a high degree of managing and um, safety and risk. Um, there was something else that he was good at. But anyway, his triggers tricked uh, ticked him over to paramedical. Right. Okay. Aged care is a big area, it's a big yeah. growing area. He yeah. got a job in aged care, loves it. Wow. Okay. There was another woman who was also out of manufacturing, and actually she had very high personal selling, very much liked communication, um, very much liked being with people. Mm. She triggered retail sales. Mm. Now, this was pre-COVID. She got a job in retail, never had a job in retail. <laughs> we, we heard she was going gangbusters and then obviously COVID hit. Yes. But that's, you know, the thing is that if you play to people's strengths, mm. so we do that. In that case, the reason I call it out is because, again, we're working with businesses to do that. So one of the things we're seeing now is going back to your example with the, um, with the uh, students, we have people, uh, there's a job job training two that's coming out. The government's going to pump half a billion dollars, I think, into training skills. Well, guess what? We're getting a lot of these organizations who want to identify where people should go for the skills training through Cert 3, Cert 4, mm. because they have the same need. Mm. Those companies that do the referrals basically get paid on um, the placement first, but then they get milestone payments as they move through to completion. Mm right? Mm. So they're incented to make sure that someone's going to get into it. And if they have no business being a doctor, that they don't drop out halfway. So people are using that to help individuals find what they're really well suited for. Mm. All I, I mean, I, I, all I keep thinking now is that, that just the, what that would end up meaning uh, for people's experience of satisfaction in their jobs. Well, what are you saying there, right? They're winning. But then also, uh, I mean, we don't work uh, independently for most part. For the most part, we're always working as a function of a team. Totally. And if, if at, on the le whilst we've got on the level of an individual, a level, a level of satisfaction in my job and, you know, fulfilment and joy, I know even for myself or even for staff that I've worked with in a team, that when that's present, there is, number one, there's uh, confidence that occurs in people's conversations. People are certainly more courageous in, uh, in the, uh, you know, the conversations themselves. There's, it's a, in fact, I'm reminded, uh, I, I just published a, an article just recently about teamwork and I used uh, two different images. One was the soccer, you know, the Australian Matildas, uh, you know, celebrating the, the, the success. And on the, on the converse, there was a, I put in a picture about the rugby league players in the middle of a scrum. But I used the scrum picture and the huddling 
it, for me, it was about when, when teams are really at their best, it doesn't always look like it's the joy, joy, happy, happy. It actually looks like they're able to rumble with each other to get Absolutely. success and get on the same page. Challenge, and challenge each other. Yeah, exactly, That's right? right? push. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I'm present to the opportunity, I suppose, of what you're saying is when you get all those things working, there's the presence of confidence, there's the presence of courage. And, and I know one of the biggest challenges we talk about in team performance, um, Mike, is trust and how psychological safety is one of the biggest things missing. And I, I'm really interested. I, I just want to now flip the conversation okay. if we can into trust because and I'm gonna and I, I'm I'm a big fan of speaking from myself and my view rather than my opinion about because I think we, you know, I just that's just my preference. Um because uh, I, I think we've all got a different view about how things we can all be right about how we think should think other people should be and what things are you know, like really. So I want to look at this from the from the point called trust because psychological and safety and, and trust, and I could be very wrong because I'm not the academic on this, but psychological safety to me suggests that I want to feel like I can trust other people in my environment to speak up, speak freely, say what I'm going to say without the threat of, you know, fear of losing my job or fear of what other people will think of me. That, you know, now I'm bringing my personal lens in on that, right? And, and and some staff that I've seen. And then they talk about the problem as if the problem psychological safety, like it's independent of it's independent of me it is a thing that exists and I'm not safe therefore to talk now to me that talks about trust but why I say trust Mike is because that is the complete I don't know that there's a concern for trust when you're dealing when we've got an environment where people have the experience of being completely satisfied thriving and being a contribution now I could be completely off track so what, what, what's your view about everything I've just said or whatever? I don't know. Where would no, you no, like no. to start? Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Um, you got my head spinning. So let me start with uh, uh, trust is a big one. Um, so let me just tell you my personal view on trust from experience of uh, basically baptism by fire through trust. Okay, I'll start there, and then I want to pull it back to teams. Great. And then I'll try to pull it into business teams. Fantastic. Okay? All right. So personally, I had the best, most painful experience in my life was trust, okay? And it, it was trust that hit, that I failed with trust to understand it. Um, and they all, all those failures came to hit me at one time, three times in a row. Yeah. Okay, so I, I got to think about this a lot. What I personally took away from it is that as a leader, um, I trusted too broadly mm. because I consider myself trustworthy. Mm -hmm. So I more or less, what if you call it, deferred that or conferred that on everyone else. Okay. And as a result, I was trusting people to do things for which had I been a better leader at that time, I would have identified that they were not trustworthy to be doing the things I was allowing them to do. And those came back to bite me. Right. Okay? Right. So, my personal view on trust is that trust is a lightning rod word. Mm. It's too vague. Mm -hmm. It's too broad. And what I try to do is when I work with team members, um, business partners, family members, I try to do a better job of identifying where do they have track record, capability, integrity and interest such that I can determine whether they're trustworthy to do that. Mm. And that's where I focus my time. If they get into areas in which I estimate they are not trustworthy, I put a little more attention on it so it doesn't get out of whack. Mm, mm. Make sense? Yeah, makes sense. And I want to take it now out of conceptual mm -hmm. and uh, I'll, I'll start with... Uh, bringing my confession in on this so that we can get <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that we can get an uh, uh, kind of on the court look at what that looks like so uh, I personally you know my wiring as a human being through my adolescence and you know upbringing you know I had some circumstances that were you know uh, left me with the experience that you know I can't trust people mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. A couple of bad incidences, got myself into a situation that I shouldn't have been in, was too scared to tell my mother at 12 years old, so didn't tell her, ended up in a bad situation and then didn't tell anyone because then I didn't want to get in trouble, 
But so rather than as a 12-year-old, now I didn't know, obviously as a 12-year-old I didn't know, but, you know, in my investment of personal development over the last 20 years and seeing plenty of therapists, uh, I, I realised that, you know, at, for me to protect myself, I had to blame myself mm -hmm. firstly, but the, it, that was masked by a decision that I couldn't trust other people because I never felt safe mm -hmm. around people. Now, that was uh, in it, it kind of the, you know, so I don't know if you know, but, you know, I'm kind of a bit of a neuroscientist in the area of resilience, right? So in the connections that were occurring at that stage of my development, what happened was that started to fire up and so I created an entire life around not being able to trust people and mm -hmm. gathering evidence for I can't trust people. And, I, and so then I became somebody who, a bit like what you were saying with yourself, I, I actually was overly trusting with people mm -hmm. when I would meet them um, b because then eventually I could be right that I can't because if I set them up for that they're very trusting, inevitably at some point they'll prove me wrong That's and right. then I will not be able to trust them and then I'll be right for that, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> how crazy we are as human beings. Anyway, that's kind of the confession part about myself, right? Now, I, I've done a lot of work on this for myself so that such that I can be accountable for it in the background so that I'm no longer operating out of the subconscious, but I'm in the conscious mind realising that any time I'm about to take an action that's a setup for that, I, I, st I stop it. I pause, breathe, think about the situation and then I reframe about whether or not I'm really dealing with trust. Now, my problem was I think I was doing what you're saying about the broad brush thing. I think I was just like, I just don't trust people. Like yeah. people can't be trusted. But the truth of the matter is what I'm now hearing and what you're saying is there are certain things that I could absolutely, hand on my heart, no problem. I could trust myself and I could trust others to do certain things once I'm clear about what it is I could trust them on or not trust them on. I don't have to kind of broad brush this whole, I just don't trust or, oh, I trust like that. It's like, no, 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 hold on. Let's just be responsible for what you're talking about. Well, look at this. I mean, basically, Leonie at Sprouta was the one who introduced us. Yes. She said, hey, Mike, I think you should go be on Kylie's show. You were open to it. I trusted her. And I, tr I defer that to you to have this conversation where you're asking me about trust. All right. <laughs> all right. Yes. Um, but if right now I got a headache and I had an aneurysm in my brain and you go, Mike, I can take care of that. Yes. Here, I got this sharp instrument here. Let me operate on that. I would not trust you, mate. <laughs> okay. Nor should you. Right. So I think, understand. Let, let's take it back. Let's, now let's move that to teams though, right? Yes. I think, um, and maybe it ties to not trying to, it into your childhood in any way, um, but where we are feel safe is when we understand and there's transparency about the environment, the rules, the expectations, mm. what we're doing, right? Yep. The best teams that I've ever been on were the ones who didn't pull any BS, spoke it like it was, even when it hurt because we just knew that that was what it was. You move on, you fix it, and you keep going, right? Mm. One of the observations that I've seen that I'm really, really pleased about is in 20 years that I've been in this space, I've observed, um, and I come on the people side of tech, in other words, HR side, we've had a lack of credit, but we've had a cred issue mm -hmm. okay, in the business. Right. The business oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes doesn't get us. Because we talk in this airy fairy type thing. Right. Right? Right. One of the interesting things that I'm seeing happen with our customers that are using us well are the credibility and partnership and trust, trustworthiness specifically, to be focused on the business mm. between HR and the business lines is increasing. Why is that? Because for the first time, HR is able to come to the business with quantitative evidence showing what the overall teams and individuals inherent capabilities are and they're all about defining quantitatively what is good. Mm -hmm. You want to you want to you want to deal with the VP of a business line, you show them data supporting why I'm telling you this. Now you got cred. Yeah, right. Right? And what ends up happening is the best customers are the ones that are doing that exercise, but then what they're doing is they're bringing it to their teams. And this isn't mm. this, this isn't Myers-Briggs. This mm. is at a much more relevant detail. It's at mm. a competency-based, capability-based level. But when you bring that type of data to a team and people are able to look at what are the team's strengths and opportunities in the capability balance sheet, yeah. 
where we sit individually and share that with others, yeah. now you can have a transparent conversation. Yes. You know where people stand. Yes. And guess what? You might have an environment, a better environment of trust because yes. they're not going to say, hey, Mike, can you go do this? No, Mike, I'll go, mate, that's, why don't we get Kylie to do that? Kylie's better at that stuff. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, because there's clarity. All right. That, that's what the All Blacks do. That's what the Wallabies do. Is that right? Uh, sorry, I wish they did. Actually, <laughs> no, no. I meant, I, I meant what they do is they, they know. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> what they do is they know what their capabilities are, and they know the capabilities of their team members, and they don't, they don't put people in positions in which they shouldn't. Well, you, now you've got me really in love with this conversation because <laughs> uh, I'm reminded of the money ball, right? And, ah. and well, two things, actually. I'm reminded two. So firstly, two things. One thing, two things I love about this, Mike. Number one is that, the, the, that we're no longer having to talk about attitude as the source of performance. Um, and there's a brilliant TED talk by a lady who talks about, you know, uh, the attitude's not the problem, isolation or something of it was. But it was that, you know, you can have the, the worst attitude on the, on the planet according to to, you know, other people's opinion. Um, but when you come together as a team, your job as a team is to a accept that people are going to have bad days and good days and attitude is just a function of our emotion and blah, 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 right? So short story there is I like this because we're now going to get our goddamn attention off personality profiles. Sorry to everybody who runs personality profiles. Um, as a source of performance, and we're actually going to get into the practical ability of action taking, which is all around capability skills. So that's, that's the first part. All right. Second part I love though more than anything is the application of that like I remember watching Moneyball right the whole theory like my I'm whole so strategy for, for this year is I've got my son my 10 year old son so inspired like we played a game I said honey the game is Moneyball the deal is we're going to look at the actual data uh, in, in no, the so game they looked at the data in the game and they put in players not based on their friggin opinion I want singles and I want base hits yeah I, it's so funny you say that because I use Moneyball that's the Oakland A's right yes right yes and Billy Martin. Yes. The problem is I can't use that analogy down here because we play cricket. Oh, so what? I know, but, <laughs> God, but Jesus. it's so funny. This is Moneyball. That's what you need to do with your business. Yes. You have to look at the data. Yeah. You have to make the determinations. And if your balance sheet, Moneyball, if your capability balance sheet on your team has a big gap in this stuff, you need to yeah. make an informed decision. Can you build can you build the capability in your team? And exactly. are those people able to do that? Are they going to like doing it? Or do you bring new people in? Yes. If you don't have the quantitative insights to do that, yes. you're a blind dog in a meat house. Oh, God. That's, that's, oh God, I just felt like that's me. My, <laughs> that's my life. <laughs> yeah, so, Being really no, frank. I, oh, my I, God. I'm like, well, oh, there's my gap right there. <laughs> I think actually, I think in the questionnaire that you sent me, I yes. actually put money ball in and then I go, no, Australians don't get money yeah, ball. I pulled right. it out. I love it. I, lo I, I can't tell you. I've lost count of how many times I've watched that film. So whoever's listening, if you want to watch a really, actually two, <laughs> if <laughs> they're two, they're two movies. Oh, I got another funny story. That's a different time. But um, Moneyball is a great, great movie about looking at what you have understanding the rules of the game and dissecting it with data and then appointing people to it. Mm. What does good look like? That's what they did. Mm. Then what they did is they went out and they said, well, which people have it? And in sport, it's easy, right? Yes. Sport's easy because in sport, we can... Yeah, but that's because they've got the data. Well, they've, they, they have the data, but like, for example, they said, you know, why are we going after the people that hit home runs? They're expensive. We don't have a budget. That was yes. where the A's were. They were competing against the, the, the uh, Yankees, right? Yeah. Okay. So they said, um, they said, um, uh, you know, we want people that run base hits. In sport, you can see somebody. You can see that a triathlete um, does all three segments and is, you know, making progress or not. In work, we don't have that. You can't see whether somebody is winning or not in work until it's 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 in yes. the, it's in their heads. Yes, yes. Well, it's more like golf, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, golf golf is a great example, right? Golf yes. is you know you can get people that the swings look the same. Yes. But you know the difference between Tiger and me is all in the head. Mm. He's consistently calm. He can focus. He can do those things. You can't see that in business. In mm. sport, you can. It's called it's called biomechanics. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about is neuromechanics. Yes. Right. And, yes. And what are the what neuromechanics are good? 
right, in a particular role. And then who has that mix of neuromechanics? That's yes. what we do. Yeah, right. Actually, interestingly, I was telling you the story. So Kev, uh, he's a wonderful man, right? And we get into COVID, and just like everybody else, we had to sort of tighten up and adjust and put our head in the swivel and be smart and this mm -hmm. and that. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sweating, but busting our gut, you know, mm -hmm. surviving. We're cool and everything. What does he do? He goes out and he works with some of the top coaches in Australia and the, and the PGA to define what is good in an elite golfer. Hmm. And we just released last week a profile. If anybody likes golf, go to our website. You can see that we got a profile for elite golfer, and it's doing exactly what you said. You can complete an imprint, and then we'll compare you and give you a report on an elite golfer. And one of the coaches will actually give you time to coach you on what you need to do to improve your neuromechanical skills to be a better golfer. Wow. That's fantastic. But that's what he does during COVID. <laughs> 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 Oh, that's extraordinary. Wow. We tried the same thing with the U.S. sailing team, actually, but our lead, who was an Australian, um, uh, our lead uh, wound up moving on. But, you know, there's a lot of commonality between sport and business. The problem mm. is it's easier to see in sport. Yes. And it's biomechanics, and we do neuromechanics. Yeah, yeah, it's fabulous. Gosh, uh, we could talk about so much. Uh, Can I come back to trust, though? Just Yeah, sh uh, yeah, absolutely. Because the one, the one thing that I, I, I think is really, really important is as we've been able to tap into the neuromechanics of business, um, I can't underscore enough the value of the bridge that it's building between the business lines and HR. Mm. Okay? Mm. Because the business lines have the people. Mm. When all of a sudden we can talk about their, their economic or, or the, their economic capability, mm -hmm. if you will, mm -hmm. and then we as, we as HR can start supporting it in a way that's targeted and impact with data, mm. that's Moneyball. Mm. Mm. And that builds a, a, a team environment of trust, transparency that I haven't seen in my 20 years. I'm pretty bloody right. excited about it because it's always been frustrating that you go to the CF, CFO or whatever and they don't, you know, why do you need this training? How do you know you're not sheep dipping everybody who actually needs it? You can show mm -hmm. it. It's a whole different conversation. Great. So I'm going to uh, kind of take us off onto a different tangent. Okay. Just to complete on um, the conversation. Because uh, ser seriously, you and I could just keep talking about that forever. Uh, I want to actually just go, go on to a few questions about your personal experience. Okay. Um, uh, and because it's going, we're going to cover all dimensions called, there's a real passion that clearly comes out of the conversation you and I've had and a problem that you're solving, which is going to do enormous amounts for people. Then I actually want to see from your view about how this has transpired for you. Um, I want to start with, uh, I'm going to, a, a couple of brief questions but then I want to ask one question where I want you to kind of dig a bit for me firstly um, if you were to reflect on your journey today and just share with me what is the one of the great look oh god uh, no doubt there's been a lot of successes right I can't I can't got to acknowledge that but is there a standout for you um, that's had a big impact on your experience of success or greatest accomplishment that you could call out yeah absolutely um <clears throat> But it, it's not necessarily just my success. It's the success of the team that I was fortunate enough to bring together. Um, short version is it was my first gig as a CEO. Uh, I took over a company that was a lot like the company out of San Francisco that got me into this space. Um, and I did this in uh, August of 2008. And the company was said to be making 18 million bucks and losing three. I knew a couple guys on the board, and they go, Mike, this is right up your space. You know, I'd been sort of country head type stuff, but never CEO of an old, my own company. And, uh, and they said, you can do this. And I go, okay, what's the gig? And he goes, well, we want to get it to 20 spinning, you know, spinning money and possibly you know, sell it off or list it. And I said, that sounds great. 45 days in, something didn't smell right. Turned out the company was doing 14 million, losing seven. Mm -hmm. So going back to that trust thing I told mm, you about a little bit, you know, yeah. the board should have been trusting somebody else to do the books. <laughs> yeah, right. <rough. laughs> but anyway, the reason that was hard was that, as you may remember, in, um, what was it, September 15th, 2008, was when Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy starting off the mm -hmm. GFC. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was 45 days into a job. I had 140 people, 40 cars on the road, six offices across Australia, and we had two weeks worth of cash. Okay. Mm. So 
Um, the short version is we, I recommended to the board that they go down a certain path and, and we, I interviewed and appointed a voluntary administrator. The great news was the team that I pulled together um, were rock star good and we basically in the eye of the GFC in January raised $3 million, bought the company out of administration, went on, the company traded, grew, blah, blah, blah. But we went from, it, we sold off portions of the business. And so I, I made the decision to take the company from 140 people down to 40. Wow. So we had to let 140 people go in the eye of the GFC. Mm. My and my team's greatest accomplishment is in that point of time, out of the 100, 99 had jobs without any disruption. Wow. Okay. One retired. Wow. <laughs> That's remarkable. So I'm always really proud about that. I bet you are. That's like, and you know, I've done, I've, I've been, I've been really fortunate to do some cool things. But um, I think it goes to um, when you take on a leadership role. Um, you know, people say, people say, um, you know, you got to balance all sorts of things. You got to balance your customers. You got to balance your shareholders. You got to balance your team. Mm. But my view is, if you don't have the team in that environment of trust we were talking about, mm. and they know that you got their back or you're going to do everything you can to have their back, then, then if you don't do something along those lines, then you're probably not going to get very far. Yeah. And so I, I actually, that still to this day remains one of my proudest things, that 99 people and their families did not get spanked in the GFC like they could have been, you know, really hurt. Wow, that's extraordinary. Extraordinary. I'm, 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 look, I'm... T- I don't like speaking after a moment like that. I just want to sit in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, it's good because we got COVID now. We're going through it again. <laughs> oh, exactly right. Exactly. Uh, you know, my hat's off to everyone who finds themselves in a position like that and what, what it takes because I get that there's, you know, it's not an easy ride to do that. Right? Oh, so it was well scary. I mean, yeah. it was, it was, you know, this was my first lead, true lead gig. Yes. And uh, yeah, there were a lot of stressful nights and mm. probably drank too much some nights and, you know, it was, it was really, but. Boy, did you grow. Yes. Boy, did you grow. Running a company on cash, great experience. Mm, wow. On the flip, we're going to go to the other side of the equation. Okay. And uh, I want to do this in particular because, you know, you and I were speaking briefly before we started and this conversation for me, you know, there was so many beautiful things in it um, and parallels, not not just from what you and I are going to talk about with this one, but also I think for the the value that it pro- really provides for people in your sharing of it. Um, and, and it's the question about what is the, um, you know, you, you got your greatest accomplishment that you're proud of. What, what have you found has been the, the greatest or the biggest challenge or obstacle that you've experienced? And as a result of that obstacle, what is the lesson that you, that you learnt from that? Yeah, I, I, I'd probably take that back to our, our conversation on trust. Mm-hmm. That, that's where that goes back. Um, I think that um, I was, uh, I did not understand the difference between trust and trustworthiness and identifying whether mm-hmm. um, somebody has competence, track record, integrity relative to doing certain things so I could determine whether I should trust them with that. Right. And so by doing it too broadly, it meant I wasn't accepting responsibility for what I was either what I cared for or what I was responsible for to the degree I should. And once I had that clarity, um, I could better support my team as a leader. Mm. Um, I could better develop them to know where I could push them and where I couldn't because mm. I'd taken the time to, um, to do the diligence, to make a judgment as a leader mm. about where can I trust different people under what capabilities. Mm. And and when I when when I hadn't done that well the first time it was really tough. <laughs> right. I got spanked really hard. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> so it made you think about it a lot. Oh God, I can imagine. So uh, sounds like there's a really valuable lesson in that about, uh, and I, I kind of call it thinking. <laughs> I suppose I'm maybe conscious thinking, but when you talk about the word of due, you know, doing our due diligence about things. Uh, I think in the current climate, well, you know, this is not just the current climate, but I think we've been in this space for some time now that with the pace in which we're operating, you know, the expectation to move very quickly, um, you know, with technology going as rapid as it is, it does have us work in in an environment that has us try to run at lightning speed. 
And the the pitfall, obviously, in doing that is it doesn't our brains not really it doesn't optimize when we're you know trying to run that quick. Uh, it gets optimized when we in fact do the opposite that we slow the brain down, right? So. Yeah. You know, when you say that, the thing that I'm reminded of and, and I'm constantly reminding clients of is, you know, the importance of slowing everything down in their life um, so that they could do the right kind of thinking. You know, I mean, even making decisions about things, you know, decision making is not something that you rush into. You do the due diligence, you know, you do the, the thinking, you do the considerations, you work out scenarios, you weigh things up. You, But we're not doing a lot of that. Now, I, I'm generalizing in, mo in a lot of regards, but, but I'm just pointing that out in this particular conversation because of what you said around due diligence. Well, let, let me give you, a, let's take it back to a really basic example um, because and I'm going to take it from a leadership example, okay? Um, in February, um, I think was th that's when I first heard about what was going on up in China with the virus. Right. Okay? And I was talking to a mate of mine, and we were, you know, having a beer, having a steak, and, and I said, you know, if this thing goes this way, it's going to mess some stuff up. Mm. People are going to have to, like, get out of offices. Mm. And so I came back to Kev, and I go, Kev, um, can you get the team and can you guys look at if everybody had to go work like from home, what are the capabilities that need to be present to work in isolation? Mm. Okay. On March 6th, I was having coffee with one of our customers who's a CEO of about a 10,000 person organization. And he said, Mike, I've been thinking about you. Can you give me a profile that tells me whether if I push this button to push 10,000 people from home, are they capable of working? Can you identify the people who are going to have difficulty sustain it? And can are they going to be productive? Mm. And I told him, I said, give me two more days and it'll be done and it's done. Wow. All right? mm. Now, in May, I was having difficulty working in the global shed quarters on my own because, as I think we would both agree, you and I like people a lot, right? Yes. I was mm. missing people. I was missing coffees and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And mm. I was getting a little funky in the head. <laughs> Yes. And I couldn't figure it out. I was riding my bike. I was getting more exercise. I was still funky in the head. So yes. I took my imprint and I put it against that profile. Mm. Okay. And what I found was that the items that I was low in were a lot of the items that needed to be my team had identified as being effective, necessary to work in isolation. So what did I did? I go out and I went on the web and I found, uh, refresh myself on smart goals. I have the skills. I just don't like using them. <laughs> the reason... <laughs> Got it? <laughs> Sorry. We're being honest here, right? <laughs> I love I love it when people are honest. Okay, I'm being totally well, honest. I'm here. only laughing because I'm hearing myself in it, there of course, right? But I, I guess the reason the reason that I'm saying this is as an as leaders in an organization, if we understand where our people's cap inherent capabilities are, we've never had that before. Mm. And it's letting me, and I'm best, I built the damn thing with Kev, right? So I know how to use this thing. But I'm starting to see our clients use this, and it's creating a level of transparency, of objectivity, yes. Yes. of quantitative evidence, money ball, that yes. allows people to basically have conversations with evidence back that we've never had before. Mm. And it changes the dynamic. Totally. So anyway. Totally. Was, it, was that a good wrap up there? Oh my God, yes. So I want you to end this, this interview on okay. a statement for me. Uh, I'm going to start with it and I just want you to repeat it and then complete the sentence for me. Okay. A leader is someone who. Okay. A leader is someone who captures the heart, head, and hands of like-minded people gives them a safe environment where they can grow, challenge, and be successful, gets rid of obstacles and creates opportunities to realize the purpose. How's that? Thank you for providing that. That work? Well, my view is whatever comes from you <laughs> is actually your comes from you. So I, you might, I don't know that most people would know this yet about me, but my superpower is in language and one of my favorite quotes is from Wittgenstein uh, that language the the limits of my life is the limits of my language or something like that and you know there are no accidents to the choice of words we choose yeah and that which we say says who we are 
Yeah. So whilst most would say that their, their, their automatic consideration of that question would be that they're giving an opinion about what they think is right, actually what's being said is, I'm telling you who I am. So I say thank you because I see you. And, I, I, you know, I don't say that often because people say it's a bit bloody weird. weird. And I, I go woo-woo with people when they go, I see you. I'm like, what the fuck? Are you serious? I see you. What the fuck? Where? What? Anyway, I just put a bit of humour into that one. But, you know, I, I, I'm interested in having people say that because I'm interested in – I'm, you know, you, you say, oh, you know, you and I like with the people side of things. Absolutely. But you should know. I mean, I, I'm an old-school data scientist – an intro, introvert by, you know, by my wiring. Quite frankly, I'd prefer not to be in social environments much with people. Mm-hmm. Not because I don't like people, I love people. But the thing that has me, the only thing that has me interested in being in those environments is because I'm the person who will be sitting in the corner wanting to have a, an actual meaningful conversation. Right. Do not stick me in there with somebody who's going to just do all the bullshit stuff. Has You know, I'm just, my husband could sit up all night, right? God bless him. He could socialise till the cows come home drinking wine and beers and rambling about anything. What time should I come over? <laughs> but he can ramble about anything. And I look at him often and I go, and, and at one point I seriously had a, you know, a, 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 an awakening when I'd stopped making myself wrong for not uh, being like more like him. But then I went, no, hold on. I, you know, he's great at that and he's really good at that. I'm just not interested. Now, it's not because I don't like you. I'm just not interested in, I'm really interested, not that I'm not even interested. I'm just interested in really... Getting to know people. You want people. the substance. I know, absolutely. Give yeah. me the substance or nothing. So thank you for sharing yourself. Thank you for joining me today. It's been absolutely joyful uh, on the flip of trust. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to kind of getting to know a lot more about the work you're doing and really having being able to have an impact with getting this kind of conversation out there for people, really, to be frank, because I think what you're doing is solving a massive, massive problem. Well, thank you very much. I am... Um I really appreciate the opportunity, and I hope it uh, gave value to some of the people that are listening. Yeah, thanks. Well, thanks. All the best.